this is uh, FRC Storytelling Through Multimedia. Uh, my name is Steve Silverman, and uh, I'm on the 971 team as a mentor. I'm a curator of the 971 photo and video websites. Uh, if you're looking for videos right now, this is probably the YouTube channel is probably a better, better place for a full list of all of our videos. Uh, but for photos, the 971 photo archive, which you can get to from 971's photo page. Uh, I've been involved in, uh, yeah, question. Yes, the, uh, the question was, will the recordings be posted on the YouTube channel and uh, all the sessions we're recording will be posted on the channel, as well as the presentations. The 971 website will have links to the presentations, just the, power, the slides, and a link to the video. Uh, but if through this, you can, you'll be able to get just to the video, but the slides you'll have to go through 971 website. All right. Uh, I've been involved in educational robotics, which is FLL, FRC, Botball, a few others for about 15 years. And my passion for the last seven years has been uh, focused on media, which is uh, video and photography. Uh, what I want to do is a quick question. Uh, what do people hope to learn from this workshop? Any, any? All right, later on, I'm going to ask about photo, video, your interest in some other, some more specific aspects. But uh, I, I've got a lot of slides. So I've got way more slides than we can get through. So uh, I'll tailor it. Some of these things I'll just skip through. Uh, some of them I'll, we'll spend more time on. If there's something that's of particular interest, uh, feel free to you know, raise your hand and ask, you know, ask me to slow down for that section. Okay, uh, so we're going to start. These are just some buzzwords. And if you're, if you're new to photography and video, you'll see these words. Uh, I'm not going to walk through them here in detail, but they're helpful if you start to read about uh, photography or video. Uh, there's these buzzwords up here. Terminology for this... For this, uh, this seminar, I'll use the term media to refer to both photo and video files. And it'll be both raw files, edited files, and if you create your own video project from splicing together uh, video pieces of video and files. Uh, I'll, I'll use the term media to encompass all of those. Uh, I'll talk about low light, especially if we get into any of the more, more advanced topics. And low light has to do with the idea there is cameras, uh, in general, cameras like light. They like more light. And so taking pictures in low light uh, means that the camera, you, it means your kind of camera is going to struggle a little bit. That by, when I say low light, it just depends on the camera you have. But even the best cameras like more light. And so with, when things are moving, the challenge in FRC is you've got things moving, which means you generally want more. The cameras want to be able to have more light when you take a picture of something moving fast. So there's a bunch of physics we won't go into, but that is a challenging aspect of FRC, at least for 971. Um, video, when I say video, it, it generally includes the audio that goes with the video. And publish is my, a fancy word for sharing. So uh, when you see publish, that's what I mean. Uh, for this workshop, one of the things in preparing for the workshop, I wasn't really sure whether we would have beginners, intermediate, advanced. So uh, we'll, I'll try and cover a little bit, and that's why I have a lot of slides, but I'll, I'll need to tailor it a little bit to the audience. So uh, to avoid overwhelming people, I will do some oversimplifications and generalizations. So if you're fairly knowledgeable about photo or video, please don't be offended. <laughs> um, but it's really aimed kind of at, at intermediate level. So then the last three bullets on here are some really high level advice. So one is review your photos and video. If you take, you take pictures, you take video, if you just pick a few, post them, you really don't, there's no improvement there, right? And then the the same things you did well, the same things that worked for you that didn't work for you, you'll do them the next time. So if you take the time to look through your photos, look at your video, look at them critically, think about what worked, what told a story, what caught your attention, um, which things were like blurry. You know, some things will be blurry. If you can figure out why was that blurry, uh, it gives you an opportunity then to get better and better, uh, you know, each year as you, as you go on. Uh, second thing would be think about goals for your media. So. And we'll talk about that a little bit more details, but the idea here is if you think about what you're trying to achieve, then when you take the photos, take the video, uh, you, you kind of have a better chance of capturing what you want and capturing things that'll be useful. And then the last one is the more you capture, the more options you have. So if you take lots of pictures, you may not use them all, but when it comes time to try and put together a story, it, you know, having just the right picture helps, but the only way you get just the right picture three months ago 
where you didn't know what you, where you were going to be now, but three months ago you took some pictures, take more, take extras, and then you get to kind of cherry pick. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So the, for this presentation, I'll talk about some basics, talk about storytelling, and then if we have time, and depending on people's interests, we can talk about more specifics about media, which would be photos or video, capturing, editing, and, and uh, publishing. So this is kind of an opportunity maybe for me, me to ask, um, show of hands in here, and I'm going to ask, are you primarily interested in photos, primarily interested in video, or interested in both? So how many people, show of hands, are primarily interested in just photography? Okay, few. Uh, how, are there anyone who's primarily interested in just, in primarily in video? Okay. And then how many people are, hopefully it's all the rest of you, how many people are photo and video? Okay, all right. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm interested in storytelling, how, how to figure out what the story is and how you accomplish a story. Okay. Because I think that's, that's a big deal. And the, the comment was, we definitely want to make sure we cover storytelling and how you tell a story. And uh, that, that part, I, I will, I'll definitely go through that. Uh, and that part doesn't have to be quite as tailored to the, the specifics of photo or video. So we'll definitely cover that first. Uh, and then uh, second question is, how many people would consider them in beginner, intermediate, or advanced? There's, there's no specific topic. Don't get hung up. Don't think about it too much. Uh, how many people would consider yourselves a beginner and intermediate? And advanced? OK. So bad news for you. <laughs> We're mostly going to, I'll mostly, there's, I have some advanced items in here. I'll mostly flip through those slides. But feel free afterwards when you see them, you know, happy to talk about it, you know, either online or in person. Um, and you know, the, the, maybe there's a few interesting tidbits here, but we won't spend a lot of time on them. Uh, all right. So with that, some, some basics. Uh, you know, this is a quick 45-minute session, right? But there's a lot of great material about photography and video and creating stories and editing video, editing photos. There's a ton of information out there, um, you know, free, free things on the web, stuff you can read. There's books. There's great videos on the web. You can take classes. What I wanted to do here was, if you're kind of new to this, when you're reading about photography, there's different types of photography. And when you get into more advanced levels, there, there, there's very specific differences here, but in general, if you're reading about photography and something says, somebody's saying, well, this is great for event photography, that's where for FRC, your ears should perk up. Because by event photography, they mean it's not staged, people are moving around. You know, it's, it's very different than, say, a wedding, which has a lot of posed photos. It's very different than, say, landscape or architecture photography, which is generally there aren't people, things are kind of static, it's big, wide pictures. So, when you see street photography, sports photography, and event photography, your ears should perk up because those things, those sort of things are similar to a lot of what you would do in FRC. And the ones in the middle are a little bit, the ones at the bottom, not so much. Uh, question is what's street photography? Uh, so street photography is kind of like you walk around with, with a camera and you see something interesting, a person, a place, some event, and you take pictures. So it's uh, the difference between event photography is event, it's a predefined thing, it's kind of a constrained space. Street photography is more like just wandering around and taking pictures of interesting things you see. Tends to be mostly daylight, um, but it, the aspect that's similar to FRC is a lot of times there are people who are moving, you know, you, you aren't in a position to say, okay, everybody freeze. <laughs> Um, you know, street photography is more like kind of being incognito, if you will, you know, not, not interrupting the subject. All right, uh, moving on then. So what are your goals for media? So when I say that, what do I mean? So uh, I've listed here some of the things that we use photo and video for in uh, 971. And, you know, it's a lot of different things, but 971 is a team where, you know, we, we do a lot. And it's a, a team with a lot of passion. And so... You know, you'll see the pictures in the media. They're helpful for technical docs. Uh, that, you know, they're useful for sharing with sponsors. Giving, if you have sponsors, it's great to get, make them feel engaged, let them see you know, what their sponsor dollars are doing. Uh, the one thing that, that I'm not really going to try and cover in this seminar, and I personally don't do a lot of, is sort of social media and real time. So when we, like, something's happening in a lab, we want to take a picture and share it with the team in real time. You know, that is something that's better. Everybody's got a cell phone. 
it's great. You take a quick picture, you send it out. Uh, you know, it's not something you're going to spend a lot of time editing. It's not something you're going to go take 20 different pictures and pick the best one. So uh, I work on everything except that aspect of it. So um, we won't, won't really see a lot of that here today. Uh, but it's an important thing. It's just it's a very different type of photography. Okay. Uh, image quality. So one other thing to think about is when you talk about when you take pictures, depending on what you're what you want in the end. If you're if you're looking for just a quick picture, people are going to look at on their cell phone. That's when you go to edit those pictures, for instance. That's very different than the pictures that you would want first that somebody might put on a big 27 or even a bigger screen, uh, or if people are going to be zooming in and looking at detail. So cell phones, we'll touch a little bit on equipment, but cell phones are great for pictures that you're going to look at on a cell phone. They're not so great for something if you're going to do a lot of editing and try and you know, do subtle shadows and, and really try and draw someone's attention to certain things in the photo, because everything's kind of flat in a, in a picture you take with a cell phone. So that's what I, that's what I mean by um, um, what your image quality goal is. All right. Uh, just some, so here's some quick examples. You know, this this is a picture that's not really a picture for 971. It's sort of a picture that might be interesting to anyone who was at the Houston Championships that year. Uh, you know, here's a picture that's just a student and an interesting piece of a robot, technical documentation, and a plaque that we give to our sponsors. So those are some examples of how you can use media. All right. Uh, and then uh, Mike was asking storytelling. So. When I say storytelling, what I mean is think about your audience. You want to tailor to your audience because what you're ultimately trying to do is convey some sort of story. So, uh, and that doesn't have to be video. You can even do that a series of photos. Sometimes even just one or two photos can convey a story. Um, but what it does is the, for 971, the idea is we try and combine. You've got people, you've got robots, and you've got the journey. We call it from kickoff to, to hopefully championships, but at least to regionals. And uh, I'll give I'll have some examples later about how a series of photos can almost tell a story. Um, but at that point, any questions? It's just so quiet. I want to make sure I'm not putting everybody to sleep here. All right, anyone who's awake, raise your hand. Hey, all right, all right. Uh, okay, so here's here's a picture. It's an interesting picture. I love this picture. Um, I didn't take it, so I can say I love this picture. But um, you know, the context isn't at all clear, right? If you saw this picture by itself, you would have, unless you were there, you would have a hard time figuring out what's going on. But as part of a series of three pictures, kind of the team went to NASA, was invited to visit the NASA house team in Houston, and you know, the team got to go into the, this area where the team has a field and some, NASA has some displays. And this was something that, that was on one of these little side rooms. So that's an example of kind of conveying the big picture, a medium picture, and then something specific. Uh, so here, um, question, can anyone figure out what these two pictures are trying to convey? What's kind of the subject or the story? Yeah. They're working on the robot. They're working on the robot. Yeah. Anything more specific? Sorry? Putting transmission together. Putting, yes, putting, uh, the comment was putting a transmission together. So we've got students putting a transmission together, and then students are actually maybe not the best angle. Like I said, uh, later on I'll talk about taking pictures in different angles. This is the, them actually mounting that transmission on a robot. It's the arm gearbox for the 2018 robot. Yes, yes, the arm gearbox from the 2018 robot. It was a rather large transmission. Uh, okay, uh, the other thing is, th this is about trying to convey, it's easy to take pictures. Certain things you will naturally be drawn to take pictures of. People smiling, people assembling a robot, things like that. Uh, every year, at the end of the year, I try and look back at what aspect of the team did I, did I fail to capture, right? What should I work more on next year? And can anyone tell me what these are pictures of? The implementation of scouting from practice to event. Bingo. Exactly. I, I've succeeded. I'm happy. You've made my day. So this, this is students working on preparing for scouting and then doing scouting. And that's a big part of 971 team, but it often it doesn't naturally draw a lot of photo photographic attention. Uh, but that's an opportunity for you to, to broaden out, tell a broader story, if you will. 
All right, uh, I'm going to just play a couple of quick videos here. The first one is going to, the intention here is to illustrate the essence of the game, not necessarily to show every aspect of it, but to just quickly kind of show the essence of the game and, and the robot from the team that year. Okay. So the, the first photo was setting the stage, if you will, and this is showing a little bit of what the robot was and what the game was that year. Now, question, how many of you noticed that when I showed them building the stack, I didn't show all six crates? Ah, okay. So I showed the first one, so you see that idea of how they start, and then I wanted to show finishing the stack and moving it, which I thought was interesting, but the fourth and fifth crate, not that interesting, right? So I kind of tried to splice it so that it, your, your attention was not on the fact that I jumped, but more on the fact that the stack was building from one up to six. So that's, a, that's an example when we talk about storytelling as opposed to just playing a, playing a whole video that you took. Um, and the idea is you, want to, you can convey more in a shorter period of time. And that's really the game, because it's easy to take a lot of video, it, it's just hard to watch a lot of video. All right, uh, let's see, I think, let's move on then. The, uh, another one I had here was, uh, so this next video is showing a series of activities on day one of the season. And again, it's, it's, so the idea is here trying to show a sequence of events. The events may not have actually all happened in the exact order I play them. And we'll talk about that a little bit more too, right? There's some tricks. Uh, that's just setting the stage. This was part of a larger video. How did that drive the capabilities of our robot we want? From A, where it starts, B, to pick up the cube. We can set 28 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second. We probably need to know how much mass has to leave the rest of it. We can bring it up. Oh, that's just a little bit. Yeah, that's a little bit. Yeah, this is a prototype of the robot. Yeah, this is a prototype of the robot. Okay, so what you saw there was represented multiple pieces of video that were all much longer than what you saw, and other video of the, each of those topics, multiple pieces of video, which I threw away because that little set was what I, what I felt was the minimum I needed to convey that story, to capture some of the people, capture some of the activities. And so that's, that's the idea of storytelling as opposed to just posting photos and posting video that you take. So... Um, all right, let's move on then from there. So is, is that kind of starting to make sense to people? Questions or, yeah? So for shooting those kind of things, do you have like a designated photographer that just like stands around and just shoots video and different things? Yeah, for the most part, that would be me. Um, but it, if you have multiple people, it's actually great. Um, but I tend to focus mostly on that. At first, I was a mentor, did a little bit of video. Then I w was a mentor doing a little <coughs> bit of technical we okay? <laughs> um, I started doing a little more photo and a little more video and eventually I've evolved to where I pretty much focus about 90% of my time as a mentor on uh, taking a lot of photo and video. But we do like, as I mentioned, some of the photos I like best, you know, some of those are pictures that other people have taken. And also like how long do you spend like taking those kind of clips if you cut down things like that? Yeah. Uh, so, I'm insane, um, but I pretty much am around most of the time the team is meeting. Um, and there's one of the benefits is that way I, I kind of understand the context, right? It's not only do I have the photos and the video, but I, I, I watch what people are doing. I'll ask questions. I'll talk to people. Um, so I kind of have an idea of, of how it all fits together. And then that way, when I'm trying to pick which media to use to try and tell a compact story, or if I've got thousands of videos from a week, uh, photos from a week, and I'm trying to pick just a hundred or so, 
um, it helps me kind of convey a little bit of everything. So it, it, uh, the more you take, the better. It's, you know, obviously at some point you have to decide, you know, your time, but the more the better. And, and again, the more you take and the more you study, you'll sort of learn what works better so you get more efficient as time goes by. So that was sort of the storytelling part of it. I hope that gave people a little bit of a, a feel for that. Uh, what I can do next then is jump into the media. So now the kind of leading into your question, right? The, the how do you get the photos in the in the video? So uh, in the slides, which again I, I won't have time to go through all of them, but the way this structured is, I've got some information about capturing photos, some information about editing photos, and some information about publishing photos, and I've got a set of sections similar things about video. So it's kind of the way it's structured. Again, I'll I'll pop through with a, again for the more advanced topics, you'll see a few flash by, but um, Hopefully you'll still gain something and we can talk maybe afterwards about some of the more advanced pieces. So capturing photos, and again, there's lots of material out there. If you want to talk about composition and when you take a picture, how do you, you know, what do you put and how do you look for lighting? I won't go into that here, partly because it's a huge topic and partly because I'm by far, I'm not really an expert in that, right? I've learned it a little bit, mostly in my quest to focus on FRC photography. Uh, but what I will try and do is, talk about what, what makes FRC unique, right? Taking pictures for FRC, there's some aspects of that that are different than a generic description of how to take good pictures. So that's what I'm gonna try and focus on today are some tips. And if things don't make sense or if there's some jargon or terminology, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, and hopefully, as you, if you kind of go down this path, as you learn more outside of the seminar, hopefully anything here that doesn't make sense, hopefully it'll kind of make sense. Also, you can also email me. Um, you can also find me you know, at tournaments and or come and visit 971, right, if you want to learn a little bit more or talk about it. Uh, all right, so with that, uh, if you, here's a great example. If you think you might use photos in a video, take your, try and take most of your photos in landscape. That means like this. You can turn your camera this way, and that's called portrait. And it's called portrait because turning your camera this way is a great way to take a picture of a head, you know, someone's, someone's sort of shoulders and head. But if you try and use those photos in, mix them with video, video is always this way, right? You know, we're not going to turn the screen. So if you have a lot of photos that are portrait, it, it becomes more work to figure out how to use them with video because you either have blank stuff on the side or you have to put multiple ones together and you always have this white space. So uh, that's a, an easy tip is try and take most of your pictures in landscape mode. Okay, make sense? Uh, and this one, we talked about this already, is, is spend more time with the team. Uh, that's a great way to, to be able to learn more. It's an opportunity to take pictures, but it's also a great way to learn what the team is doing, why they're doing it, uh, a little bit of the philosophy behind it, as well as the design of the robot. How do the pieces of the robot work together? Take multiple photos, so that's a, it, best example I have is if I'm taking a picture of, of this laptop as part of my FRC team, I would probably take the first picture this way, right? I see the keyboard, I see something displayed. But later on in the season, maybe I've got someone who's working on the laptop and I want to take a picture of them. That picture I probably would take from over here so I can see that person's face, right? So if the only picture I take of the laptop is from this angle, and then I take a picture of a person from that angle, it's harder to convey some continuity. So if I were taking a picture of this laptop early in the season, I would probably take a picture from here and one from this side and one from the back. And then later on, when I, when I have this picture of someone I took, I've got their face, if I wanted to show that same kind of somehow convey, well, there was the laptop and then the person with the laptop, I, I, would, I would use the picture I had taken from the back angle. So that, that's a reason to take your photos and your video from different angles, right? Uh, it'll come up later on on a slide, but or actually the bottom here is safety shot. So now that's a great piece of advice, but there's another angle, which is you want to get something. Something is better than nothing. So it's a little like designing a robot, right? When you design a robot, make sure it, you, make sure it can score some points. Make sure it can score the easy points before you try and do the, the more advanced stuff. So when you're taking pictures, you see something interesting or important, Take a picture. If you're playing a lot with manual settings on your camera, pick some safe settings, take a picture. And the idea is that way you've got something. Now, if you have time, you can then take different angles, play with camera settings, take different shots. But you want to get that first shot because it's a dynamic world, right? You, you, 
something can change. That person can move on, something can break, you can find something more interesting. So uh, call that a safety shot, right? And then try the more variety of shots that you might use later. So get something first, then try and optimize. All right, uh, so story time, we talked a little already about wide angle, medium, and close up. Uh, digital zoom, this is a great one, especially if you're using a cell phone or some sort of a, a simple camera. Digital zoom is really the same as taking a picture without zoomed in at all, and then cropping it down and taking just the pixels in the middle. So, and that's important because all the other pixels are getting thrown away. So in terms of the quality of the image, you, you, you'll get the same picture if you take it without it zoomed in and then crop in. Same picture as if you do a digital zoom and take the picture. So in some respects, why throw away bits before you've even had a chance to consider what you'll do with them? Uh, question. Um, so for, photo uh, photo for photography, uh, when you're photographing a robot, do you use uh, the sports mode uh, to take constant <coughs> photos or do you prefer to use a different option? Yeah. Uh, so a question was, uh, do I use sports mode or, pre or prefer a different option? Sports mode does two things. Uh, it, one is it tells the camera, it's a little bit, uh, auto, camera autofocus works, you know, it works okay. Manual settings are better if you're willing to take the time and you have the time and the equipment. But sports mode tells the camera, one is it tells it, hey, things may be moving fast. So it tells it how to adjust things like aperture and exposure time and ISO and a bunch of other stuff. It tells, it tells the camera which ones to make to, to treat as more important for this photo. The other thing is it may take rapid fire shots. So I'm breaking that apart because uh, sometimes I'm, when I take pictures, I will, I generally use manual settings so I can control all the different settings myself rather than kind of give the camera a hint. I just t tell it what I want it to use for settings. But I do sometimes use the rapid shooting. Um, my camera typically has like a mode of about three frames per second and another about 10 frames per second. I find that 10, frame, 10 frames per second just creates a lot of photos of very little difference. Um, so I tend to use about three frames per second. What, what it is great for taking multiple shots, like having the camera just go boom, 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 boom. For example, if two people are talking, it's surprising how hard it is to get a picture of two people talking where everybody looks, um, uh, where it's flattering, right? Because nine out of 10 shots of people talking, you've got the, and this one, and you've got the hand wave, because you don't, until you take pictures, you don't realize how fast people's hands and mouths move, until you realize how hard it is to get a picture with no blurred mouths and no blurred hands, so, or heads moving. So uh, it's a great, that's a great example of whether it's in sports mode or just rapid shooting mode, take multiple pictures, whether it's manually or have it take a couple, because especially when it's unposed people, you really want the ability to quickly throw away 80% of them, and then from the other 20%, you look at them, spend a little more time, and throw away half of those, so you're down to 10%. But great question. All right, uh, pay attention to the background. So that's another great tip. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've seen something, loved it, took my safety shot, took a dozen other photos playing with the camera setting, different angles, looks great looks great on my little little camera screen. I get home, put it on a bigger screen, and all I can see is that something in the background that just draws my eye, you know. Um, it can be something as simple as an exit sign, you know, that just draws your eye. So when you kind of take it to the next level, when you go to take that picture, just think about what else might draw your eye. Like, here's a great example, right? An orange hat, you know, I just, I looked up for a minute, right? And in the back, you've got that, that orange hat. And, it's great, but like if I'm taking a picture of you, I'm typically going to have that orange hat in the background. And so that's an example where orange hat's fine. I'm not trying to pick on you, but what, what it means is if I notice that, I'm going to come over here and take your picture, right? As opposed to getting it to where the orange hat is right behind your head, right? Or at least get the orange hat so it's further away from your face, right? Yeah. There you go. But again, and that's, that's my job as a photographer. My job isn't to ask you to move, right? That would be posed photography, but in kind of event photography, unposed things, my job is either wait for you to move or, or I move, right? And, or, or wait until he moves, you know? But again, get, that's the good example. Get the safety shot, then go try and find one that doesn't have the orange hat in the background or not as prominent. 
All right, is, it, is this kind of useful to people, right? Is this, okay. Um, <clears throat> the biggest technical for, so FRC, right? FRC is relatively low lighting, relatively lot of motion. And as I mentioned early on, that's a big challenge for cameras. And it's one of the reasons that I, I as I've tried to get more advanced in photography, the lenses keep getting bigger. The camera bodies get bigger, but that's partly just because it doesn't make sense to put a huge lens on a little teeny camera body with a little sensor inside of it. And it's really, it's not about the length of it, or it's about the front element on the lens. How big that front element of the lens is determines how much light you're capturing. Everything after that is just how well it captures it and how well it deals with low light. So uh, unfortunately, there's no, there's physics, people have, electronics have kind of figured out a lot of cool things. They, they've figured out a lot of neat things you can do electronically. And they, pictures, electronics can compensate for low light, and that gets better every year, but they're just compensating. They're not really some fundamentally changing the fact that if things are moving fast and a camera wants to capture an image, you really want a lot of light. So, um, I'll talk a little bit more about you know equipment, but that that really does drive a lot of FRC stuff. And you know again here, this is a great example, right? Our labs, nine seven one labs, are mostly classrooms, so we don't have nice bright lighting. You know, it, it's kind of like this; it's relatively low lighting. All right, uh, it, I think I talked here about backdrop, right? I mentioned uh, you know pay attention to a backdrop. Uh, one neat trick is so this picture, which is just showing the whole range of different prototypes we did for the suction cups this year. I think I was mentioning, who's it, was you us talking to? Someone before the session, uh, we were talking about suction cups. So this is a picture, and, and the question is, well, how do you do that, right? You could, if you were doing, uh, say, product photography, you would have a special studio with all white background and special lighting. But we don't have that in 971. So this is how I took that picture. This is the same picture. You can see this is a white poster board, another white poster board. Take the picture, and then I, it's pretty easy to kind of blur out that white seam there. So, so that's, that's kind of the game, right? It, uh, the other thing is, and then when I talk about editing, one of the things I can do is, with a photo editor, you can turn up the whites without turning up the brightness of everything else. So if you look at these two pictures, the, the brightness of the actual parts is, is only a little bit brighter. But if you look at the background, the white is so much brighter and whiter. And that's just a, a trick that you can do with photo editing. Um, it's, not a, it's actually a fairly simple one. So if you're, you know, it, it may not be the kind of thing you get if you're like editing in the cloud you know, with a simple free tool. But if you kind of take that next, next step, um, you can kind of play those kind of games and adjust things. So the idea, again, being if you look at this picture, your eye might be drawn a little bit to the seam, to the background, to the the, the floor over here, the green jacket, right? But when I give you that picture, your eye can't help but be drawn to these, these suction cups. How'd you right. get rid of the seam? Hmm? How'd you get rid of the seam? Uh, so the seam is, uh, one of the things that's relatively easy to do is, uh, it's, like an er it's like an eraser, it's a magic eraser. You kind of go, yeah, hide this with whatever you see around it. And so one of the things is I'll try and put that seam, ideally I would place the board so I don't have a seam, but in this case, I, I, it, there were a lot of them, so I used two boards. It's relatively easy to do this scene because it's all white and white. And when I boost up that white with editing, you don't really see the difference between one white and the other. Um, if you look really closely, so now if you, if you look at this close enough, I got a little lazy over here. Right, so this is where I erased something, but it wasn't a perfect erasure up in this corner. And you can see a little bit down here and a little shadowing here. Do, do you erase the scene first, then boost the white? or? Um, good question. Do I erase first or boost the whites first? Um, uh, sometimes I'll try both. So if it's a picture I really like, I may try. I may try one, and if that doesn't give me the result, I may try it the other way. And that's an advantage of the more advanced editors let you kind of try something and then try something else without redoing it. Right? You can make three different changes and then try flipping the order in which it applies them. Um, so again, that's something that's uh, as you play with the more advanced editors, you get a lot of options. What software do you use to edit uh, this picture and other pictures? So the question was what software I use to edit this picture. I use uh, something called Adobe Lightroom. Um, it's kind of a watered down version of, as an editor, it's a watered down version of Adobe Photoshop. Uh, Adobe Lightroom was originally designed more for 
indexing your pictures and sorting and deciding which of three pictures. So it lets you kind of look at three pictures side by side and zoom in on all three at the same spot. So it's really for, originally it was designed for managing large amounts of photos and culling them. And it let you do very rudimentary editing. Uh, over the past couple of years, it's gotten to where it does 90% of what I want to do. You know, if I put it in Lightroom, I can do 90% in, if I, sorry, if I put it in Adobe Photoshop or something more advanced, I can do 90% of that in Lightroom. And usually that's good enough, right? Most photos, that's, that's good enough for me. But it's, that's a very personal taste, right? And it depends on, um, you know, budget and how much time you want to put in and, you know, what type of, what other type of software you use. All right. Uh, all right. Let's uh, drop in along here. So uh, I talked about sort of that idea of wide angle and narrowing. Oh, question? Question. Question, yes. Uh, so I know we haven't gotten to videography yet, but it's kind of related to that. What software do you use to edit videos and kind of put different clips together? So the question is, what, uh, what software do I, do I use to edit videos? Uh, I use a program called Vegas. It used to be Sony Vegas, and I use a pro version of that. Uh, Sony sold it off to another company. I forget the name, so now it's just, on, now it's just called Vegas, uh, or it goes under the new company. Uh, it's a fairly advanced one. Uh, what I'll say about editors is, the more advanced the editor, the more the learning curve. So it's probably not good to jump in with a super advanced editor because it'll let you do a ton of stuff, but it won't let you do anything easily. So um, I, you know, I'd say start out. Sony Vegas is or Vegas now is a reasonable tool, but um, you know Mac has a lot of good tools. It depends a lot too if you're on a PC or Mac. Um, but we can we can talk afterwards about it if you want. Yeah, it's a very it's a very powerful tool. Been around a long time. It's not. It's not super expensive, but it's not cheap, and it, it does have a learning curve, but it's very flexible. Yes? Um, so, do you recommend any of the Adobe products for video editing? Um, I, so, do I recommend the Adobe products for video editing? Um, when I first, about 10 years ago when I started doing a lot of video editing, I played with, around with a relatively cheap piece of software. It was good enough for what I wanted. The problem was it wasn't very stable, so it crashed a lot, and then when I wanted to like take pieces from multiple projects and merge them together, like take some editing I'd done from two pieces of video and put them together, being able to open multiple sessions. At that time, Adobe had some limitations, and so that's how I latched onto this Sony Vegas Pro. So um, I think you kind of have to analyze for your use. Um, it's certainly widely used. There's lots of support, lots of help for it, so not a bad choice. Yeah. Um, I just want to add a quick little anecdote. If you are just getting started with video editing, uh, Windows Movie Maker is free and on Windows, or you can really download it for free. And then iMovie, they're great tools to get started. You don't need fancy things to get started. It's just as you, you will go and you hit your limit with those tools. And that's when you want to upgrade. I would say don't spend a lot of money on an editing platform until you have gotten used to editing. Yeah, I would second that. And I don't know if we picked it up on the microphone, but the idea was, uh, iMovie and, and uh, uh, movie, Windows Movie Maker are both free. They're both relatively easy to learn. They're both can be reasonably powerful. So it's best to start with something like that. And then when, you've, when, you, feel, when you you'll know when you've outgrown it. That was a great comment. And that's the time to maybe think about, hopefully by then, maybe you've had a chance to talk to other people and look at some other tools. Yeah. Uh, great, great comment. Great question. Thank you. Uh, so just simple here, right? This is, you can sort of see the first picture is, what do you see, right? In my mind, you see a lot of people doing CAD, or at least sitting at computers. Uh, lots of students and a few mentors. Uh, you know, the, here you're sort of starting to see people working in groups. You know, it's not just everybody isn't working together. Each person isn't working alone. So you've sort of got a little bit of people interacting and working in groups. And you've got some Lay's potato chips. Um, which, by the way, if I were really, you know, that's an example where if that drew my eye particularly right, I, I would try and filter that out potentially. Or after I get my safety shot, I might go and actually move the bag out of the way and take another shot. Uh, over here, it's, this is more intimate, right? You, you know, down in the, in the left corner there, you're, you're sort of now it's like conveying students working together, right? There's a little bit of an interaction. You, if you look, you'll see they're all sort of sharing a keyboard. And this is the other extreme. So here, it's de-emphasizing the people, and it's really emphasizing that screenshot of the cat. So that's an example of how this is all the same scene, but taken from different angles with different camera settings. It helps, sort of, it, hopefully it draws your eye or gives you a different impression. Okay? 
All right, um, and we're coming up on time. I'm going to go quick through to get through at least the photo portion. Uh, probably won't get to video much. I love this picture because how many times do you see someone in the real world using a protractor? <laughs> That's just cool, right? That's a protractor. That's cool, but it's you. The context of that is pretty fuzzy, right? You wouldn't really know what you're doing. But if I show you these two pictures together, now it's someone using a protractor and they're actually, you get some idea of what they're doing. They're measuring an angle of a robot for, for reference for some piece of software or some test we're doing, okay? Um, this is an example of a unique, seek out a unique place, seek out a different uh, perspective. So this is a picture of uh, Houston Champs last year and I wanted to get a shot of all the fields. And you can't, really, you can't really get at the end of the field. There's no place to take a picture from the end of the six fields where you, where you aren't just blocked by everything. So for this picture, I went to the highest spot in the stands. I went to the back corner of the stands. I put my camera on a monopod and raised it up about six feet as high as I could and leaned it back as far as I could off the back of the, off the, back of the bleachers to try and get as, as much of that wide angle shot of, of the fields, right? So, it, I think there's a next one. This one's even better. So this was in, I think, St. Louis, maybe um, a couple of years ago in St. Louis, the pit area. And if you've ever been there, you'd wonder, how do you get this shot other than having a drone, which they didn't even have drones much back then. So the way I got the shot was I was looking to get a view of all the pits. And I noticed there was a window. And it was dark most of the time. But one time I noticed there were, it was, lights were turned on. And it looked like some people were in there, maybe having a banquet or something. So. I waited a while and I went and found my way, searched the back stairways and found this room and I found that the, the caterers were there cleaning off the tables and taking away the leftover food. The meeting had ended and I asked, you mind if I come in? And I went in and you know, got my camera up against this glass and took this shot. So um, always look for a different perspective, right? Um, here's another example, perspective. So same basic activity. If you think about it, I wish I were that fast, but obviously this was not shooting the same, the same time, right? This was not the same ball launch from two different angles, but I'd have to be really fast. But, um, you know, when you look at this picture, there's the ball and the people. For me, that's a little more interesting than the first one, although the, if the first one is more conveying, hey, the ball's going through the goal, this is more kind of conveying, uh, like, people doing something, right? All right. Who can tell me the, what, what I'm trying to convey with these two pictures? Anyone? The prototype's the real thing. Prototype the real thing, that's one aspect. As you say, trying out different types of rollers? Trying different types of rollers, yeah. So that's an example where, and this is a great example because these two pictures may have been taken days apart. They may have been a few hours apart. They may have been days apart. Um, Obviously, the screwdriver magically changed into a ball, but other than that, if you ignore that. Um, but whichever one of these I took first, I probably took from multiple angles. And I probably took the other one from multiple angles. And then when I, at some point, I realized I have two that are the same angle, and so that's kind of cool. Okay? All right. Uh, I think that's oh, uh, another example of perspective. So this was taking a picture at uh, Houston? St. Louis. St. Louis. Louis. Thank you. My intent was to try and convey that there's multiple FRC fields, right? Not just one field, but multiple fields. And I took this picture one day, thought it was pretty good, went back to my hotel room, looked at it on a bigger monitor that night, and it, it just, uh, it, I couldn't quite get it to convey that, right? I could crop it and I could play games with it and change the brightness and the shadows, but I really couldn't quite get it. So the next day I went back and I found a different perspective where I just went up and up and up and up and up and up in the stands, up to the nosebleed section, truly nosebleed section, where nobody from FRC was. It was dark, it was dingy, but it allowed me to get a photo with that, that kind of the big picture that I was trying to convey. So that's an example of move around, right? You know, take a safety shot and then if, try and improve on it. All right, uh, I'm gonna go pretty quick. We've just got another minute or two and then we'll try and get at some questions. Uh, Auto mode for cameras, it's great, it's convenient, but um, at least experiment with manual settings, especially cameras have ones where you can manually set certain things and let the camera adjust other things for you. Question? No, okay. All right, uh, this is an example of a picture you won't get with auto mode, right? The camera just isn't, even if you set it in sports mode, it's just not gonna be smart enough to capture what you're looking for. 
Um, this is my, one of my favorites, right? Um, and again, in low light, it's challenging in low light, right? This is, a, this is a tricky shot. This is probably one of hundreds, easily three or 400 photos that day. Yes, Michael? This was in manual mode. This was in manual mode, so yeah. Talk about how you did that. Uh, so, yeah. Please. So a question was, uh, how did I do this one? So one is, I need a zoom lens that, that, that can get me close enough, because I can't get out on the field and stand right near it. So that's that aspect like event photography. Um, it's not a pose thing. I have to be far enough away, so I need a, a zoom lens. I need a lens and a camera that are good enough in low light to be able to capture a photo like this where it has to be a relatively quick exposure time so the robot isn't blurred, and it has to be relatively quick exposure without a lot of light, which means you need a pretty good lens and a pretty good camera for this to not be either blurry or really, really grainy. Did, did you have it like a tenth of a second or something? Or yeah, uh, so uh, when I like this, I'll often have it shoot rapidly, about 10 per second, and I'll just press the shutter, get three, four, five shots. And then the next time the robot comes over that same place, I'll take three, four, five shots. And the next time it comes over that same place, I'll take three, four, five shots. So um, it's just a matter of taking enough photos that you get lucky. I mean, in a way, it's a, bit, it's a, it's a matter of you get lucky. Yes? Uh, oh, uh, yeah, great. So when I mentioned digital zoom, what I, what I, I, that was only half of the story. Um, optical zoom, so a zoom lens is optically, is doing zooming through optics. And so there, you're, you're not throwing away any of the, any of the, the picture, essentially. So uh, that's what that's the idea of a zoom lens, is it lets you kind of zoom, but the sensor and the camera, you're, you're using everything you've got. Digital zoom, and cameras will sometimes have a digital zoom option. If, even with a zoom lens, your camera may, may give you the option of doing zooming optically, and then it'll zoom digitally if you want to zoom more. And that's a great example of, if you're, as you get more advanced, turn off the digital zoom. You know, if you're doing more advanced work, optical zoom, very useful. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, Another, so uh, like for someone who's more advanced, you realize this is a shot from up in the stands with a, a very high magnification zoom lens. Uh, because of the angle, you'd realize you have to be up in the stands, and that means I had to be pretty far away. Um, so that's a, that's a shot that A, you need more advanced camera, and B, you also are not going to get that shot in auto mode. You're going to need to learn how to manually uh, set the camera. Uh, challenging lighting, so this one's kind of fun. You know. The, when I took this picture, so this is an example too, in the original picture, in the background there may have been some things you could see in the background. So I, I, I won't remember, but I may well have played here with the idea of darkening just the dark parts. And, and that kind of gives you that, that, that pop, right? And it gives you that, that focus. <clears throat> All right, uh, we're just about out of time. So uh, briefly, s cell phones are great, but they are limited. Um, newer cameras are better at low light. Bigger lenses, bigger front opening are better at low light. Um, monopod, tripod, not so useful for photo if you're a beginner. For video, monopod can be useful, um, even if you're a relatively beginner. But um, as you get more advanced, sometimes if you're doing these long telephoto shots, then you really want a monopod. Tripods just aren't that useful at FRC because you don't usually, you can't usually carry it around and you can't usually set it up in the middle of a, a crowded stands. Uh, I won't touch on these things, uh, but you can, if you're interested, you can read these. We can talk about them uh, offline. Uh, stitch, so uh, great idea is if you want a really wide thing, you can, a lot of cameras, some cameras will let it stitch it automatically, but often if you use editing software, almost all of them let you take a series of photos and stitch them. It'll try and find out how to stitch them together, right? It'll look for where the overlap, you know, works well. So this is an example of, of probably six photos in a stitch. All right, now it's a little bit more advanced, uh, another flying robot. This was, I think, our third robot at Madeira that year. Um, and all right, so uh, don't have really time. Let's, let's do a little Q&A. Uh, again, I have some notes here, and maybe in a future session I can focus more on, uh, on editing or, or video. But uh, oh, this is a good one. So the subject there, hopefully you know what my intended subject was. This is the same photo. So, right, it, it's literally the same photo. I haven't even done that much in brightness or contrast or anything fancy. It's just the advantage of being able to crop. Um, when I took this photo, I, I didn't, I, to be honest, when I took this photo, I was just trying to capture the team. But when I looked at it and thought about editing it and trying to make it something special, 
I found that that was really the way that, that worked for me. And uh, I'm going to do one more here. So this is, um, this is we were, it was a Alliance Finals, and this is Mark, the, the MC, right? And we took our team photo, and then, you know, we were like, okay, we're done. And he's like, wait, 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 wait. And he popped in into that selfie, right? So that looks really great. This is the original photo. And so this one's not so obvious, right? I've got, I've got people in that lower left corner. To my eye, these gray squares at the top, right? So this is an example where by cropping and by adjusting the brightness and contrast, it make, it's almost like a whole different picture. So that's why I encourage you to, to move beyond just taking photos and posting them and get to the stage where you kind of edit them a little bit. All right. Uh, so let me, let me with that, we'll jump through to questions. Yeah. How much time do you spend? I see you in the lab, I see you taking pictures, I also see you sitting at a computer in the yes. meetings working on stuff. How much time do you spend taking pictures? How much time do you spend going through those pictures and figuring out which ones to keep and do something with and have fun with? So a uh, question was how much time do I spend taking pictures, editing them, figuring out, you know, figuring out what to do with them? I, I would say probably a, maybe 20% of the time, if that, is spent taking pictures. Probably about 60, 70% of the time is going through culling them down. Because I, I take lots of pictures. I've learned I, it's better. I just take more pictures. But it does mean I spend, it, it doesn't take a lot of time to take a lot more pictures. It does take more time to cull them down and pick the best ones and edit them into, into the, the best you can get from them. Uh, the publishing side of it is relatively lightweight. So it's the most time is really spent in the culling and editing. Yeah, uh, well, there's a question back there. And I'll... Oh, no, I had some oh. OK. Yes. So how do you store how do you store so many photos like at the competitions and then how do you store all of like the photos that you like like some yeah. like where do you store this? So the question was how do I store photos at a at an event like a tournament and how do I store them overall? So at a tournament, um, I actually carry and it, so what happens is memory cards fill up, right? Um, you can get a huge memory card for your camera. It does get expensive and eventually you still fill it up. So I tend to have like a small little, I, depending on if you have a laptop that's got a big enough drive, sometimes I just store them on my laptop so I can erase the memory card and take more pictures the next day. Uh, sometimes if I, my laptop now has a solid state disk, so it tends to not have a super amount of capacity. So I'll, I actually have some auxiliary solid state disks and auxiliary disk drives, and I'll plug those in, transfer stuff to those so I can erase the memory card, and then it... It helps if I, I, like at a tournament, I try and do some culling that night, each night, because partly it helps so I don't get home and have tens of thousands of photos, of which I want to get down to a few hundred, and partly because I, it, you know, I, I limit my storage. So um, beyond that, at home, I basically use just a hard drive, not a solid state drive. I use a hard drive because it's cheaper per, you know, per, now you can get terabytes for, you know, $100. What about like using Google Photos or like Google Drive or anything like that? I do, you know, it's interesting. I have a slide in here about Google Photos. We, the team, 971 uses Google Photos for publishing and sharing our photos. It's actually not great for that. I'm not sure I would choose it again as our main public sharing. It's not really intended for that. Uh, it's got some things that are nice, but it's not really intended. The biggest limit is you can't publicly discover anyone's Google Photos. I can't make our Google Photos something you will find in a, a, a web browser search. Um, I have to somewhere publish a link, a URL, and the URL, I can set it so that anyone with that URL can see our photos. So Google Photos is, is a, has some benefits. I've got, again, I've got a slide in here. It has some pros and cons. Um, that's how we do for sharing. But I actually keep the, my original photos are actually so big that when I load them into Google Photos, it, it compresses them a lot. I can tell it to not compress them, but then it uses a lot of space and it's no longer free. So it, it stores reasonable compression. The, reason, the resolution it'll show is good enough. So free is great, but I, I keep higher resolutions in my originals. I keep those at home, and then I keep an off-site backup. So um, I'm kind of paranoid. I keep every couple of months I back up onto a hard drive and I put that in a safe deposit box, and I have two hard drives that I cycle about every three four months. So I have total control over that, and then I often will I might put like another copy up in the cloud, um, or sometimes if I have two drives I keep two copies. Like work in progress um, while I'm editing, I, I often make a Full, full copy, and then as I cull them down, I copy that cull down set, throw away the bigger set. So I generally try and keep two copies of everything until I've got a, a copy off-site of the original. 
Yeah. Two questions. So do you use the Adobe, what was it called, Light? Lightroom? Lightroom. Does yeah. that edit and store your photos, or where um, or do you have another separate thing that you're storing them besides yeah. the Google? So the question was, what, I, what do I use Lightroom for? Uh, I use Lightroom just for editing. It's, it's also a way you can sort of tag photos with tags that make it easier to search and find them later. But uh, I mostly use it for editing. Um, and then I, I store them. I, I rename files. Different people have different philosophies here. Some people use just tags. I actually rename the files so it's easier for me to search by file name. Uh, but that's very much a, a personal choice thing. Um, Lightroom is the main editor I use. I'll occasionally use uh, uh, Photoshop or another editor, but Lightroom does, not, like I say, 99% of what I need for editing. Yeah? You mentioned you didn't like, like using Google Photos uh, for sharing. What would you bring up? Good offline topic, but there's, there's a lot of options out there. What I will say is the free ones all have limitations. The ones you pay for, you, you have to be willing to pay, and somebody has to be willing to pay you know, next year when you're gone. So. One of the advantages of Google Photos is it, you know, it, it accumulates them free until Google, until Google takes the tool away like it did with Picasa. But I'm not bitter, no, not me. Um, all right, I think that's it. Uh, thank you everyone for coming and uh, hopefully this was useful. Hi, I'm Sarah and a mentor on FRC Team 971. We hope you enjoyed this video. For more videos and resources, please subscribe and visit our website, frc971.org.